Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. My name's Paul Doyle. I'm the General Manager, Rail Freight and Ports at the Australasian Railway Association. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce you to um, Adam, who's Adam Williams, who's the Executive General Manager, Rolling Stock Asset Services at Kiwi Rail. And uh, anyone who's um, followed Adam on, on LinkedIn or his socials um, knows that he's presented a lot of um, information, interesting information about what's happening um, with Kiwi Rail um, at, at the moment and during COVID. So we thought it was a great opportunity for him to um, present to us today and, and, and give us a bit of an update in terms of what's happening in, in New Zealand and with Kiwi Rail in, in particular. Um, so I, uh, I welcome him. If we just go to the next slide, I'll, I'll run through a few of the housekeeping things before I hand it over to Adam, so essentially, uh, if you look at the panel on your right hand side, you'll see that there's uh, a little question button. You can um, submit those questions at any stage um, and we, we welcome those questions because there will be uh, an interactive Q&A after the presentation. Um, so we'll be monitoring those, but by all means, if there's something that comes up during Adam's um, presentation, then um, by, by all means send through the questions. Uh, it'll be recorded and you'll be able to actually um, see it live again on our website probably within the next couple of days. So keep an eye out for that as well. Um, but that's the housekeeping out of the way. I'm going to hand over to Adam now and uh, the floor is all of yours. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk today uh, obviously about the, the industry here and things that have been uh, happening, uh, in particular looking at the investment commitment by the government over the last uh, couple of years uh, and what that means for us going forward. Um, so agenda-wise, uh, I'll start with a quick value share and that's a concept um, for those of you familiar with a safety share or a safety moment, a similar sort of concept that we use here at Kiwi Rail. Uh, but we just broaden the horizon of that a little bit. So uh, we incorporate, uh, it might be a share around environment or behaviours, uh, some customer aspect of our business or anything else that's gone on uh, that we like to start any kind of major meeting or, or interaction with. Following that, I'm just going to spend a bit of time to set the context for both Kiwi Rail and the New Zealand uh, rail industry as a whole. Uh, I'm doing that on the assumption that there's a fair few people on the webinar that Perhaps don't know too much about uh, the history of the railway here and, and kind of where we're at at the moment. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that uh, and sort of setting the scene for uh, for the rest of the discussion, which will then move into the investment commitment um, for the budget from last year and for this year uh, and what that means for Kiwi Rail. Just talk a little bit about other parts of the rail industry and um, that'll become more clear as we go through and I'll paint the context of uh, where we're at currently. Um, and then at the end, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about the impact that COVID has had here in New Zealand and on our business uh, and, and aspects of the recovery. Obviously, here in New Zealand, we're very privileged to be in a, a space uh, kind of further along the journey than most parts of the world. But I think everyone's probably spent enough time talking about COVID in the last few months. So I'll just keep that nice and short at the end, uh, but certainly happy to take any questions on that uh, if they arise. All right, so just to start with this value share concept, so what I've got on the screen here is uh, Kiwi Rail's corporate values. So care and protect, one winning team, straight and true and great customer experiences. And what you'll notice if you can see uh, underneath there where the, the ribbon's going across the bottom, um, we've actually looked to incorporate um, some equivalent terms from the local uh, indigenous language from Te Reo Māori. And one of the, I guess, best experiences that I've had or best aspects of the experience that I've had here in New Zealand uh, since arriving a few years ago has been the opportunity to get exposure to and really learn uh, a lot about the local Indigenous culture, the Māori culture. I think that Kiwi Rail does a really uh, fantastic job of looking to incorporate where we can uh, aspects of that culture and also providing um, opportunities and, and forums for uh, people within our business who identify with that culture to really uh, bring that to the workplace and, and embrace it and indeed we encourage it right through the business and also for people like myself who uh, you know until a, a few years ago was completely ignorant about uh, aspects of that culture really a chance to learn and 
uh, and understand and experience things um, in, in a way that's uh, that just really enhances both the work and life experience here. So on that note, with the, the value share, I just want to start by sharing this concept of whānau na tonga, which uh, is a concept from uh, from the Indigenous culture and it's based around um, around family. So the, the first part of that word whānau uh, translates roughly as family, but it's got a bit of a deeper meaning than that. And um, whānau na tonga, which is the, um, you know, the, the kind of feeling around uh, around that family, really relates to relationships and kinships and that sense of connection that we develop. And in particular, it's a relationship that's developed through those shared experiences. And as well as giving you a feeling of belonging, it also gives you a feeling of obligation to that group. And I think it's really relevant to uh, the experience that we've all been through, uh, not just here, but, but right around the world over the past few months with the disruption uh, from COVID. I really feel like here in New Zealand uh, and here at Kiwi Rail, all those experiences we've had to go through and the disruption and change and uncertainty has really brought us together uh, as a family really well uh, and really enhanced that feeling of whanau na tonga. So, um, so that's the value share for today. So I'll move now into talking about the current context uh, and just going back on a bit of the history of the railway here in New Zealand, just to get to the point so um, everyone can get an understanding of, um, of where we're at. So like most countries around the world that have a, uh, a railway history, um, you know, the, the railway here in New Zealand began really in the second half of the 19th century, so um, sort of second half of the 1800s. And it began largely with very small little lines that were set up for specific purposes of carrying uh, typically some kind of bulk good between a mine or a quarry um, or, uh, or a site like that to a, to a port. And eventually over time, those lines extended and joined up uh, and started to carry passengers. And this photo is from uh, 1889, I think on the line up near, near Nelson. And also similar to um, many countries around the world, uh, there's uh, a certain individual here by the name of Julius Vogel, who's really identified as the uh, the father, if you like, uh, of, of the New Zealand railways. And um, Julius Vogel was a premier of New Zealand, or the equivalent of the prime minister now, uh, in the 1870s, and is really recognised as the person that um, that got the funding set up and got the uh, the impetus behind the real expansion of the railways right across the country. Um, this next slide just shows uh, the the network, a very simple network diagram, and it's not quite at the largest extent of the network, but um, this is um, around 1940, and the network expanded up till about 1953 was the the greatest extent. Uh, but look, this is largely showing um, where where the rail lines have been put in over time, uh, with a couple of pieces missing, uh, which are currently there. But uh, I guess you get a you get a feeling for where rail went, and New Zealand's a very long and skinny country. And um, as you can see, particularly in the South Island, the rail is very much concentrated down the east coast. And the reason for that is that the rest of the island's covered um, in, in an alpine region, basically a, a huge range of mountains. And so that proved a very difficult environment for transport as a whole, and in particular for rail. And if you can see the one piece of, uh, of network that goes between the, um, the east and the west coast, if you like, on that sort of northerly direction in the South Island, that incorporates the Otira Tunnel, which is a, a tunnel of about nine kilometres length here, born born right through the middle of uh, of the mountain range in about 1900. So the network uh, had great kind of ambitions to really join up, and particularly if you look at the North Island on the east side of the North Island, um, those bits that are that are showing not joined up, they're never quite made it to be joined up. So um, we kind of fell short of having that fully encompassed network that was joined right around the North Island and the South Island. Uh, and from 1953 onwards, we saw a, a gradual shrinking back of a lot of the smaller branch lines and a real consolidation of the network. Uh, again, very similar to what happened in, uh, in a lot of other parts of the world. And that was largely due to that investment, you know, post World War II, really concentrating on investment in motor cars and um, investment for personal transport and, and truck uh, transport and concurrent investment in roads uh, and road infrastructure projects. And again, that was mirrored not just in New Zealand, but right around the world. And I certainly know from my uh, work history in Australia, a very similar story. What that culminated in here in New Zealand is, um, you know, the, the New Zealand Railway used to be a, a very uh, large employer 
of um, you know a workforce right across the country and uh, a large kind of government entity it was a real training ground for apprentices and a lot of um, those mechanical trades for you know for, for many many decades through the 1980s um, the the corporation really shrank and it was corporatized first and then privatized through the 1990s again very similar to what happened through uh, through Australia and that didn't work really well here. Um, again, uh, like some aspects of the Australian privatisation, not all. Um, and in 2008, the government uh, actually renationalised the freight network under the Kiwi Rail banner. So that was the kind of birth of Kiwi Rail uh, as an entity, but obviously with a lot of legacy and history uh, of those predecessor entities, various government um, entities, and then the, the small uh, decade or so of privatisation. That really left some interesting um, hangovers if you like and and one of those that i found um astonishing to be honest when i when i first arrived here is uh so this photo shows a, a df locomotive and, and some passenger carriages and this um wasn't taken from the you know 1960s or 70s this was what the auckland uh, rail commuters had to had to catch to work right up until the middle of 2014. so this is only five or six years ago that um you know the main passenger commuter network in the biggest city in new zealand was being operated by uh, 30 or 40 year old locomotives. Uh, and the carriage stock there is an evolution of British Rail Mark II carriages from the 1950s. So that was kind of the state of where the railway was at at the end of that period. Uh, and left us with a huge amount of work to do in terms of investment uh, in infrastructure, investment in rolling stock uh, and, and other aspects of the railway. Thankfully, um, a lot of that started to happen in about that period. And um, this slide shows uh, the Auckland network and, and the rolling stock as it stands today. So um, in 2014, uh, the new EMUs were launched. Uh, There's obviously a huge program of electrification that went on uh, in, in line with that. Um, and now the, the Auckland commuter service is, is mostly run by, uh, by these EMU units that are provided by CAF uh, out of Spain. On the freight side though, what, what happened about this same time is that the country was going through a real debate as to uh, what was the role of the railway? Uh, what was the role of the freight rail um, outside of those urban centres? Uh, and in particular in areas where uh, the freight task that was being carried wasn't things that necessarily uh, naturally kind of formed a competitive advantage for rail. So generally speaking, where you're carrying bulk goods um, and for us, that's usually uh, milk or milk products, um, timber industry, uh, meat and, and some coal in the South Island, where rail absolutely makes sense. But outside of that, the country was having a real debate around the value of the freight railway and was it necessary and did we want to keep investing in that or not? Um, that was a really interesting time. It was just prior to me joining, but um, a lot of my colleagues spent a lot of time uh, obviously advocating for the role that rail would play and could play in the future of New Zealand. And, as this debate was going on, um, at the end of 2016, we had a really major event here, which was the uh, the Kaikoura earthquake. So I'll show a couple of photos here. This is one, and I've got another one next, just to show some of the uh, impact of that of that event. And that earthquake occurred uh, on the top part of the the South Island, that was where the epicenter was. And what you can see here on the screen, uh, obviously the rail formation roughly through the middle of the uh, middle of the picture there, and then you can see the rail sort of going off to the left-hand side as it's been pushed out from both the um, the earthquake and the slip that you can see off in the distance there. Um, the roadway there is also the main, really only uh, route between the top of the South Island uh, down to Christchurch, so that's State Highway 1. And so both of these key arteries were cut uh, for a very significant amount of time. And this um, second photo, which uh, is just coming up now, just shows the extent of some of the um, the movement in the earth uh, uh, and the, the surrounding infrastructure. And, um, you know, the country at this time had a really important decision to make about, well, was this actually the end of the railway uh, and that link between North and South Islands down to Christchurch? You know, was it going to be worth us investing in reinstating uh, both the infrastructure and, um, and the railway itself? Interestingly enough, um, my view, I came just after this event and joined Kiwi Rail, but my view is that this event actually really solidified the railway's position because what happened is uh, all of a sudden all that freight that we've been carrying on the trains back and forth each day had to be carried um, largely by road and so some of it went by coastal shipping 
um, but a large amount of it had to be carried by road. And so all of a sudden we had a huge increase in um, the number of truck movements through that top part of the South Island. And also because the SH1 highway was cut, a lot of those truck movements had to go via secondary roads. And so that had a massive impact on those communities and also really uh, tore up that secondary road network. And I think it was a really um, kind of vivid uh, demonstration for uh, society here around the value of rail, even though it may only be uh, a relatively small number of trains that are plying this line back and forth each day, the impact on the volume of trucks that need to be carried on the road to do the same freight task uh, was really starkly uh, laid bare to everybody. And I think went a large way to us um, to helping us get the argument across the line for the value of the railway uh, really as a whole. So one of the things that was going on in the background at the similar time by, by coincidence was that the um, New Zealand Transport Agency, which is uh, the equivalent of the kind of Department of Transport um, back, in, uh, back in Australia, was going through a review and trying to understand what the value of rail was for New Zealand. Um, and so Kiwi Rail was obviously involved in, in inputs into that report that was prepared um, by, by EY. Uh, I've got a link there on the slides and um, for those of you that want to have a bit of a look afterwards, uh, you'll be able to get that from the slide pack. But the short version is that that report came up with, um, with some justification saying that the value of rail for New Zealand as a whole was in excess of about a billion and a half dollars every year. And that encompassed um, the commuter and freight rail side of things. And that value was delivered by you know, reduced congestion, um, reduced uh, impact of obviously carbon emissions of rail versus road, uh, safety improvements and, and so on. And it really sort of hit home right at that critical time that rail really did provide a huge amount of value for New Zealand, even though it might be not uh, immediately visible in a tangible sense from day to day. The conversation from there uh, obviously then moved to the rebuild of the uh, the main north line, as we call that part of the, the network. Uh, and that was a process that is still going on now. So I was actually in the South Island over the last two weeks uh, over the school holidays on a road trip with my family. Um, and as we travelled through this part of the country, there's still quite a significant amount of roadworks going on, um, even though the, the kind of part that was required to get the road and the rail open was completed in about 18 months. Um, there's still some ongoing works there, uh, which just shows you the, the kind of scale of the impact that such a short but violent event can have. So the next conversation that happened around, um, I guess, around rail was uh, one that Kiwi Rail was really pushing over the last three or four years, which was to try to get um, society and, and the government here and Treasury to view rail and, you know, the, particularly the infrastructure part of the, the rail network as a public good. And to view it really in the same way that we view uh, road infrastructure, um, not as something that's a, a discrete kind of commercial entity that needs to provide a return on every, every piece of infrastructure investment, but rather as uh, an investment that a society should make in really providing that amenity and providing that value back to the overall um, country as a whole. And that all culminated in, a, in the draft New Zealand Rail Plan, which again, uh, I'll provide the link for in the slides for those of you that are interested. And that was submitted to Parliament late last year, in December 2019. It covers a whole gamut of aspects of rail and its place in New Zealand, both commuter freight uh, and tourism. But the, one of the key things from a Kiwi Rail point of view was that it um, proposes our funding for our infrastructure, so for the permanent way and, uh, and the formation and bridges and things, to not come straight from Treasury, but to be part of what they call the National Land Transport Fund. And that's the fund that's traditionally been earmarked for all of the road investment right around the country. And so what that's saying is now that from a funding point of view, the government uh, will see rail and road as part of the same suite of investment. And uh, we now uh, have access to that fund uh, and are able to go and, and bid for projects in there. It's an absolute game changer for us because it really gets us out of that uh, worry of going year to year for funding every, every year cap in hand and allows us to set some really uh, long-term strategic objectives about what we want to do with the network and, and that investment. Um, it's, a, it's a good problem to have, but one of the problems that it has created is that uh, as an organisation, we need to now understand how do we uh, interact with that funding mechanism. So how do we um, go and play in that game, if you like? Because uh, we're, we're required by, um, I guess, by the proposed mechanism to go and effectively compete for that funding 
uh, with various other road and other transport projects in that mode neutral uh, environment. And that's a great thing, but we also don't really know how to do it because we haven't had to do it till now. So we've been busy trying to learn that over the last couple of years. And that funding mechanism, if it does go through, will come in in about two years time. So we've got a little bit of time uh, to get our hands around it, but it really is a huge step in the right direction to set us up uh, and the railway up more broadly here for the future. So that kind of brings us up to where we're at in the current day. Um, I won't go through all the detail, detail here on this slide, but for those of you, again, that are interested, feel free to have a look through. It just gives a few statistics uh, around the railway here, and in particular, what, um, what Kiwi Rail uh, kind of is as an entity, and uh, some of the headline figures, I guess. So we, we employ just under 4,000 people right across the country. We're a huge regional employer, which is really important uh, in a country like New Zealand, where everyone's really spread out. Um, the, the part of the business that I look after, which is the rolling stock uh, asset services part. So we own and operate uh, an asset manager of the rolling stock assets. And for me, that's around 240 uh, locomotives of various types and around uh, just under 5,000 freight wagons. We've also got a passenger fleet uh, largely focused on tourism, um, which, which operates these kind of really iconic services through the, uh, the scenery that we have in New Zealand. But um, again, I'll leave the rest of the statistics there um, for others to have a look at uh, if you're interested. So I want to now move to um, the government funding commitment that's happened over the last couple of years. So the culmination of, um, I guess, of that value of rail report, uh, the advocacy and that change in mindset towards, yes, the railway does have a future here. I think that argument's now settled um, and there's no, no longer a real kind of existential worry uh, at the, the end of the railway here about what the future will be. So now it becomes about, okay, what do we need to actually set ourselves up to be successful in the future? and to not just continue to contribute what we have been, but actually grow the value that the railway can contribute to uh, to New Zealand. And the government really has, um, has stepped up to the plate in terms of providing funding. So in the 2019 budget, which was announced uh, in June last year, uh, there was around a billion dollars of, uh, of infrastructure, rolling stock and ferry uh, funding announced uh, in that budget. And then following on this year in 2020, an additional $1.2 billion uh, again, covering infrastructure, rolling stock and ferries. And so in total, uh, more than $2 billion, which is uh, by far and away the largest uh, investment in that time frame that there's ever been in the railways here by a very, very large margin. And um, those appropriations sort of cover uh, investment over the next three or four financial years. Um, but certainly it just kind of put really clearly home both to us and to the society here that, uh, that the government's really backing the role that we have to play. So I'll just rattle through what that means. So from an infrastructure point of view, um, I mean, probably reasonably generic uh, comments here, but you know, the, the infrastructure money, which is the the largest part of the funding that's uh, that's been provided, um, just under a billion dollars, is for increased investment in tracks, um, bridges, signals, um, renewals, and and I guess the key part for me is that really that's focused on improving the resilience and reliability of our network. So this is not about going out and looking for opportunities really to grow the network. Uh, it's not about extending um, network into new places. What it is about is really investing in um, optimising uh, things like axle loading, uh, and a lot of the resilience and reliability aspects of our network that we've really grappled with over years as the, the kind of investment ramped down over those decades through the second half of the, the 20th century. We've now got a, a huge amount of, um, of maintenance debt, I guess you could call it, that we need to clear and this funding is really focused on doing that. It's focused also on raising our axle load capability uh, around key parts of the network. So our network runs on narrow gauge here, so um, 1067 millimetres similar to Queensland um, gauge and while we did have uh, right at the start of, um, uh, of the railway here we had the same issues that, that played out in a lot of areas and, and I guess most uh, almost most famously in Australia around different gauges but uh, luckily, we settled on, on narrow gauges, the, the national gauge, pretty early on and, uh, and rolled that out right across the network. But um, most of our network now is rated to 18 tonne and above, but there's still some areas that aren't, uh, which really restricts what we can carry there and even restricts what type of rolling stock we can use uh, from a locomotive point of view on those areas as well. So um, there's, a, there's a bunch of funding in this, uh, in this round that's aimed at kind of bringing some of that network up to speed. 
And the final point there, just around aiding the transition to that new funding model that, uh, that I talked about before. In terms of ferries, so um, again, a little bit strange, I guess, for a rail business, but we also operate the ferries that go across the Cook Strait. So between uh, Wellington at the bottom of the North Island and Picton at the top of the South Island, uh, we currently operate three ferries uh, that go back and forth. And those ferries, very similar to our rolling stock assets, are, uh, are kind of right at the end of their life and, and need to be renewed. And so the funding announced uh, over the last two years, just over $400 million, provides certainty for that procurement. The, the total procurement, including the ferries and the port side sort of infrastructure, we think is uh, is just north of a billion dollars in total. But this commitment at least allows us to go and uh, run and, and, uh, and uh, commit to the procurement of the ferries. And what we're going to look to do is buy two new rail enabled ferries. So as I said at the moment, we've got three ferries, but only one of them is rail enabled, i.e. we can uh, we can push rail wagons straight on and off that ferry. So once we get to the end of this procurement, we'll have two ferries that are much larger in terms of capacity of both passengers and freight, and they will both be rail enabled, which will allow us to really uh, use them even more as that effective bridge between the North and South Island. Um, the new ferries are also going to be vastly more fuel efficient than our current ones. and uh, for those that saw the presentation I gave at Osrail uh, last year, our ferries contribute about half of our carbon emissions uh, as a business unit. And so this will be a big step forward for us uh, with, with new technology. And we're also going to look at, um, at protecting as much as possible for any future propulsion technology for the ferries. So um, very similar to, to what's happening in, uh, in rolling stock world in terms of propulsion technology development, uh, we think that the, the next step for ferries will be some kind of combination of um, diesel engine and uh, energy storage. So uh, what we're trying to do in the design of these ferries is actually protect for uh, an upgrade, if you like, or a retrofitment of that technology when it does come uh, to be more viable uh, at some point in the ferries' lives. And look, ferries, uh, again, we buy them for a nominal 30 or 40 year asset life. So these are huge decisions uh, for us as a business, ones that are made you know, even even greater than once in a generation, right? Um, very similar to what we do with locomotives. The anticipated arrival for those ferries at the moment is uh, is in sort of 24, 25, so about five years from now. Obviously quite a long build cycle and there's a whole bunch of work that needs to go into the port side as well uh, to make sure that we're prepared um, and ready for those when they do arrive uh, in that time frame. Then the third problem, and, and the one that I'm actually uh, most interested in, of course, is uh, is around the rolling stock. And similar to the ferries, what the funding that's provided does, while it doesn't commit to fund the entire need uh, of what we've identified, it provides enough certainty for us to go and uh, run the procurement exercise and get the first um, one or two tranches of delivery, um, you know, committed to and, and signed away. And and then there's an implicit sort of commitment from the government that the rest of the the, uh, the money will follow. Um, but very similar to political cycles in Australia, you know, we're, we're beholden to that as well uh, as are our shareholding ministers. So there's only so much they can commit in one in one spot. Um, but what this does do, as I said, is allow us to go to market uh, and sign contracts for these um, these pieces of rolling stock, which is fantastic. So our, our total foreseen requirement at the moment, we're looking at uh, around 65 mainline locomotives, and those locomotives will be focused on the South Island uh, and replacing our DX. Uh, what we call our DX fleet, which is a fleet of um, General Electric uh, locomotives that was introduced in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, so they're sort of nigh on 40 years old now. They've been a great workhorse uh, and provided a, you know, a huge um, a huge boon for a lot of our bulk freight in the South Island, particularly the coal and other things. Um, but they're really at the end of their life now. And so at the moment, we've got um, 47 of those locomotives in service and various other types uh, that we use throughout the South Island. And so our requirement for 65 um, four seasons is basically replacing that entire fleet uh, over a period of um, probably four to five years uh, in terms of delivery and ending up with a, a homogenous fleet of mainline locomotives there in the South Island, um, which is just going to be a, a hugely exciting time. In line with that, we've also got a new facility that we will build uh, in Christchurch to house those locomotives, and that's going to be um, built at, at our Waltham site. Uh, which is, is currently doing the passenger work for the tourism services. Um, so that concept is also pretty pretty well developed and we're timing 
the uh, I guess the delivery of that depot and, and new maintenance facility to, to coincide with the delivery of the first new locomotives um, in 2023 we're thinking at the moment late 23. The second item we've got there is uh, what we call operational shunt locomotives so these are locomotives that perform the shunting duties within our operational yards and so that's when a train arrives um, taking that train in and being able to break it up into its component parts for various customers or vice versa when uh, we go and retrieve uh, freight from various customers around uh, those sites we then bring the the wagons together and build the train up into a long train to take out onto the main line and so those shunt locomotives perform that type of duty um, again at the moment we've got a, a really mixed bag of, of locos that do that duty for us really strong workhorses but they're all looking pretty tired and getting towards the end of their lives so we're really looking forward to stepping into a, uh, a brave new world with those operational shunt locomotives and even looking at things like um, uh, electric power for those and certainly energy storage in some way, shape or form. The third item there is uh, what we're calling electric shunt vehicles and they're vehicles that we use within the rolling stock maintenance depot, so within my, uh, my part of the business. And they're things that, um, for those of you that might be familiar with those Zephyr kind of yellow box uh, electric uh, remote control shunt vehicles, though that style of thing. We're actually in the market for that right now, running a procurement process. We're hopeful to get the first of those delivered. Um, we were hoping for later this year, but likely with all the disruption that's happening around uh, the supply chain, it's going to be the early part of next year, but certainly uh, not too far away. And again, that's going to be just a, a massive generational shift for us in terms of the shunting activity we do within depots. At the moment, we're using um, you know the the shunt locomotives that are, are not the pride of the fleet. I would say the you know the kind of old ones that the operations team don't want. Um, we've got some tractors still in a couple of areas that we're using, believe it or not, as well as a whole bunch of other manual processes and other things that we do to fulfil the shunting requirements around our maintenance depots. So what these vehicles will allow us to do is really step into the uh, you know an up to date uh, work practice and really improve that safety uh, aspect of the shunting and, and control of the movements. Um, it's also will be our first kind of foot into uh, into battery power as a as a business, and so we're really looking forward to understanding you know how that works and what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of that type of uh, of propulsion. The last item there from a, a rolling stock procurement point of view is around container flat top wagons or CFT wagons, and so we've got a, a plan to procure uh, about 2,000 more of those over the next again four to five years and. We've got the first um, first lot of uh, or first tranche of that uh, currently let, um, with about 400 of those to come in uh, again, hopefully later this year. Um, our wagon fleet in total is about 5,000, just under 5,000 wagons of various types. Uh, the majority of them, say about 4,000 of that, is uh, either CFT wagons or they're on a, a base of a CFT wagon. They might have something else uh, put onto the top. Since 2009, we've um, we've replaced actually about 1,800 of that wagon fleet with with modern wagons uh, of of a, a generation um, that was that's been you know relevant over the last 10 years. But what we're we've enabled with this current procurement is actually for the first time we've gone to the market with a specification of what we want. So back in 2009, when that initial procurement was done, um, you know the business wasn't in a position really. Um, to go and, and really specify and ask for what we wanted, we kind of had to be a taker from what the market would give us. So now with the funding certainty that we've got in this commitment, it's enabled us to go and say to uh, the suppliers through the tender process that, you know, we want these type of bogies, we want these type um, of brake valves and other things of those key components on the wagons. And that's really going to set us up well uh, in the coming years for that reduced total cost of ownership and higher reliability of that uh, that wagon fleet. And at the end of that procurement, we'll basically end up with the bulk of our fleet being one of those two types of wagons. Um, and we may look ultimately, uh, when we get to major overhaul of the of the fleet that we've bought since 2009, actually upgrading that, if you like, uh, component-wise to match the, the new generation wagon that we'll be procuring from here on in. So the goal at the end of that is to uh, end up with a largely homogenous fleet um, of wagons, certainly from a component point of view, which comes with you know all the obvious advantages of uh, of training and cost of inventory holding and so forth. So that covers off um, kind of the Kiwi Rail portion of where we're at and, and where we're going. Um, I just thought I'd touch on, before I uh, get into the COVID stuff, just touch quickly on uh, other rail in New Zealand. So um, 
outside of Kiwi Rail and and uh, you know the numerous heritage operators and stuff, um, the the two commuter services in Auckland and Wellington, uh, um, Kiwi Rail owns and operates the infrastructure, but the services themselves, in terms of uh, the trains and the drivers and the onboard staff and service staff, are provided um, through a, a private company. And and uh, at the moment, Transdev is operating uh, both of those contracts. So in Auckland, as I said earlier, um, they're CAF built EMUs that are operated through the network. Uh, there's 57 three car sets at the moment uh, and another order that's in place and, and just starting to be delivered of another 15 of those uh, into there. So that will enable the um, the other bits of the network that are currently still being operated by DMUs to, to transition over to EMUs. So the whole Auckland commuter network um, will be operated by EMUs. The other major project that's happening in Auckland, which uh, some of you I think will know about, is uh, is what's called the City Rail Link, uh, and this is a this is a massive project. Um, it's happening right through the the CBD of Auckland. It's essentially Auckland's version of the Melbourne City Loop, is the way that I look at it. So, um, at the moment, the the rail comes into a station called Brudermart, which is a dead end station right in the middle of the city, and creates a huge uh, bottleneck for the capacity of the whole network. And so, the City Rail Link is basically digging a tunnel. Uh, right under the centre of Auckland to join up and make a loop, uh, and that opens up a huge amount of capacity uh, for the network and allows a vast num more number of services um, to come on board. A couple of new stations as well, and a lot of redevelopment of other stations and other parts of the network associated with that. So that's happening right now. Um, still got a few years to go till that's completed. In Wellington, um, so the Wellington network's been run by uh, EMUs for for much longer than Auckland. Uh, the current generation shown in that photo there is what we call the Martungi uh, EMU. So they're a two-car set, um, rolling stock made by Hyundai Rotem, um, and as I said, operated also at the moment by um, by Transdev. There's 83 of those that operate uh, all of the, the Wellington commuter network, but um, there's there's some kind of regional passenger services out of Wellington too, to an area we call the Wairapa, which is up the northeast out of Wellington. And also from Palmerston North, which is kind of well, direct north or northwest uh, out of Wellington. And they're operated at the moment um, by a train that looks like that. So a Kiwi Rail Loco and some Loco Hall carriages. And it's kind of the equivalent of the V Line Classic Fleet, uh, if you like, for, um, for for those Wellington commuters. So the Wellington, um, I guess, thoughts around what's happening in Wellington going forward are really focused on uh, uh, rejuvenating that regional passenger service and looking at multiple units. Uh, of some type, which I think most likely will be uh, either a bi-mode or tri-mode between uh, diesel and, and energy storage with the uh, potential of it looking at uh, at overhead as well. So that's in its concept phase at the moment. That's being run not by Kiwi Rail, but by the, um, the regional authority in Wellington. Uh, but I, I expect that to happen probably over the next um, three or four years and be committed to. All right. Um, so the last topic, just before we uh, we come to questions with everyone, I just want to talk briefly about um, the impact of uh, of COVID here uh, on Kiwi Rail and and I guess you know slightly more broadly in New Zealand and and also what's happened with our recovery. So New Zealand's in a really privileged position, right? We um, I think through a combination of of luck, opportunity, and um, you know really good strong management from the start. Uh, by the government and also a, a kind of willingness from the community here to really embrace um, that that hard response from the start. Um, we've ended up as being one of the only countries in the world that I think's really got a good handle uh, at the moment on um, on the spread of this virus. And uh, what I've put up here is just the, the little leaf that we got very early in the piece from the government that really spelt out the different levels uh, of alert, if you like, around this COVID situation. And um, from the very start, it was really, really clear to everyone here uh, what those levels meant and what the trigger points for the escalation were. Um, and as it happened, we we went straight, almost straight to level four. So within a few days of the response being initiated, we went to the hardest level of lockdown here uh, for a period that ended up being uh, about six weeks. And what that meant is, um, so essentially all businesses were closed. So anything that wasn't deemed essential uh, was closed, all restaurants and cafes and everything completely shut. Um, the only things that were open were supermarkets, um, you know, petrol stations and that type of thing. Uh, and everyone, all the schools were closed. Everyone had to stay home um, and homeschool and, um, and, and yeah, re really do that within the space of 48 hours. And that created an, an enormous disruption, obviously. Um, you know, a huge change over a really compressed period of time. 
Uh, it was a really stressful time for, for everyone involved in that, but um, I think we dealt with it really, really well as a country and also as a company. And um, at Kiwi Rail, I, I think um, Paul mentioned the, the videos that I did on LinkedIn. I, I shared a few of the videos that we did around communication, but one of the aspects that we really tried to mirror from the government's response here was to be uh, kind of over communicating and be as clear as we possibly could with what was happening, both what we did know and what we didn't know. Uh, and just to provide as much certain as certainty as we possibly could in an environment that was was really horrifically uncertain. But um, that lockdown period proved to be really, really effective. Um, for us as a business in terms of the impact, um, what it meant was we dropped down to about half of our workforce um, still coming to work. So those that were deemed essential workers, uh, we kept trains running right the way through, freight uh, traffic running right the way through. Uh, but we dropped to about 50 to 60 percent of the freight traffic being carried around as well. So it was only freight that was deemed essential. So a lot of the bulk transport like timber industry and coal and other things was stopped. Um, but we did continue to run trains right the way through. Um, for those of us that were indirect workers, um, like myself, uh, the photo that pops up here just shows me sitting, um, sitting where I am right now, actually, at my home office. And, um, you know, I was sort of sat there for uh, for that entire period and indeed until we went to back to level two. And um, to be honest, I, I struggled with that a little bit from the sense that, uh, you know, I was asking still half of, uh, of my team to come to work every day and put themselves in that position of, of, uh, of heightened risk. And I felt at some times like... Um, uh, in that scene from Blackadder, for those that are that are familiar, like General Melchett, um, saying he was right behind people and actually he was 35 miles behind people. I felt uh, a little bit like that from time to time. But one of the things that we looked to do um, to really try and keep that sense of connection was to run a lot of uh, a lot of these type of things, so a lot of webinars and a lot of uh, communication over over video conferences with the whole workforce, um, and also doing things like uh, you can see in the photo there. I used to put on my work kit. Um, and really try and feel that connection uh, with the workforce, even though I wasn't able to be there at the front line. Um, when we went back to level three and then down to level two and level one, um, what we've seen, all of our workforce has gone back, um, which has been great. And um, we've actually seen a, a, a real rebound in the in the freight traffic here. So um, initially we thought that might have been just a, a response to kind of clearing out what was... Um, you know, what was stuck in backlog from when the freight stopped, but actually it's persisted really well. And even over the last couple of weeks, we're seeing volumes, um, you know, as high as we would have expected before the COVID update. The mix has changed a little bit, but um, it, it, and no one really knew what was going to happen. So it's been a pleasant surprise from that point of view. Um, we've actually seen in some of our bulk transport areas uh, for export that the volumes have gone up slightly. And um, we surmise that that's likely because other areas of the world uh, that are providing those same bulk commodities aren't able to um, output at the same level they were before. And so there's an even stronger pull for some of those uh, commodities from New Zealand at the moment. And so we're doing our best to try to supply that uh, along obviously with our customer base and our port partners. So yeah, it's been a really interesting time. Um, the other thing that we did uh, just a couple of weeks ago was restart um, our tourism transport services. So that was one of the areas of the business that was probably the most impacted. And we stopped our tourism services, obviously, when we went to the level four. We're still not running them back at full capacity. And, um, you know, they're really geared towards international tourism. And obviously, we've got none of that at the moment. But we decided to restart the flagship service, the Transalpine, uh, at the start of the school holidays, recently gone. And actually, we had complete capacity full for that service right across the school holiday period, which was fantastic. And we're now looking at operating it on weekends for the foreseeable future. There's also some discussions going on about the other services that we had in place before um, before the, the kickoff of the COVID crisis and when we'll look at restarting those, but there's been no firm decision made on that yet. That was a really important milestone for, uh, for a large part of our business though, to get back to work. Um, so that's it really uh, in terms of the webinar. So um, look, hopefully that's been of value and um, what I'll do now is, um, I guess, move to questions and uh, open it back open to Paul, who I think is going to fire a few at me um, that have come through. So, yeah, thanks over to you, Paul. Thanks, Adam. Yep, the questions are coming thick and fast. And, and thanks again for that presentation. I think it was um, really interesting. And um, I guess, you know, if I, if I think about COVID-19 in, in Australia and what it meant for us, I guess it gave an opportunity for rail freight to sort of demonstrate its importance as part of the supply chain, particularly during periods where they're 
in the early phases where there was that panic buying. I mean, what yep. was the experience like in, in New Zealand during that sort of early early stages as well? Yeah, look, probably really similar. I think, um, you know, one of the things that we saw very early on, uh, same as what has happened in Australia, was um, you know, really a real huge spike in demand for some of those um, uh, fast-moving consumer goods. And our railway provides a really key link for um, particularly imported goods that come in through uh, the port of Tauranga out to the east of Auckland. Uh, and then it comes to Auckland and then distributed right through the country. And so uh, we had a really critical role to play um, right through that shutdown period to keep that critical, um, those critical items moving and those essential items moving through um, through the country. I think it was interesting to see both the um, the appreciation from the public here, but also the sense of pride that came from our workforce through that period as well. Um, you know, we had a lot of discussions about um, we had about half our workforce either working remotely or, or sort of stood down uh, on full pay. And um, what we found is that the people that were still coming to work really developed that sense of uh, sense of pride and, and and sort of ownership in in um, in the contribution they were able to make to kind of keep the country moving. And we really tried we really tried to, uh, to to capture that if you like and really um, capitalise on that. Uh, on that feeling to to kind of spread right throughout the business, but it was certainly a um, a very proud moment for me to see how the team responded, uh, particularly during those first few weeks when it was a really um, you know it was a brand new situation. There was a lot of stress around um, you know cleaning and PPE. We had, we had trouble sourcing PPE like everybody did, and uh, everyone dealt with that you know really amazingly well. I think in hindsight, so yeah, and I guess that was my observation too with a lot of the. Um, what was happening in Australia and I guess the other part was that for a period at least I think um, across different modes as well everyone got together as as members of the in, in, entire supply chain and just really rallied around the fact that um, you know it was important to get goods and services around the country so that's that's great. Um, the next question Adam I guess um, uh, there was a little bit of interest in terms of uh, the infrastructure fund that you talked about and how I guess for the first time you're going to to um, be up against um, other modes of transport in terms of bids yep. and those sorts of things. I guess one of the observations that we've had is that we've been good at sort of demonstrating the the benefits of of, of rail and and freight rail in particular. But then how do we actually embed those benefits into uh, investment decisions, business cases, those sorts of things? I guess that's something that you're probably sort of sort of grappling with now are there any any thoughts or, or or lessons learned as you sort of prepare yourself for that that new investment model um look it's really hard <laughs> i think it's the yeah. short version and um you know we have lent on um studies like the one that was done uh, in 2016 around the value of rail and really tried to provide um you know some form of of, of internationally recognized consensus around you know how do you measure things like the impact of congestion and um, the mm -hmm. impact of carbon. I think, um, you know, not wanting to kind of uh, spark a political debate, but uh, I think New Zealand's uh, a lot more mature in the way that um, we debate here about the impact of carbon and, and where our targets need to be. Uh, we're also in a very privileged position because the electricity grid here is largely fed by renewables. So um, you kind of, it's a much easier uh, discussion to have than it is in Australia. Um, yeah. But what we've tried to do is to work with uh, departments like Treasury who have traditionally been um, not so friendly to rail, <laughs> I think um, it's fair to say, but we've really put a lot of effort into working with them to understand, okay, well, um, the way that they they do their economic modelling, how can we figure out how to interact with that in a way that's meaningful for them? So rather than us going away and coming up with, oh, here's what we think and here's how we think we can model the value of rail, it's really been a joint effort um, and still is a joint effort. It's very much still a work in progress. Um, and I think trying to learn also off um, off the uh, NZTA, the the, uh, the the agency that looks after the road funding for the most part, about how they do it and, and how can we utilise some of the same mechanisms that they do uh, or try to mirror the justifications that they do around, um, you know, the impact on time saving and uh, and general benefit for, for society. Um, you know, I think that that may change in the next few years. I mean, there's a lot of talk about what the lasting impact of COVID will be. And certainly one of the things we've seen here, um, we were talking before, Paul, you know, we've been back to, to normal here, if you like, to level one, uh, effectively unrestricted uh, movement and working for um, a couple of months now. But 
a lot of our indirect workforce is still not working back in offices, so they're still choosing to work remotely, whether from home or another location. And I'm doing that today, and uh, and, and continuing to do that, um, you know, quite regularly. And it'll be interesting to see how sticky that is uh, in the long term. I think the experience here is showing, at least for these first uh, initial few months, um, that certainly has been the case. And you know, when I go into our head office here in Auckland now in Stanley Street, um, typically there's you know there's probably a third of the people that there would have been. Um, pre-crisis in there on any given day. So, um, you know, that, that'll that be interesting to see how that plays out in terms of that debate around congestion and, um, you know, and public transport's role into CBD areas, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, most definitely. Um, question here about just the role of, of technology, I guess, you know, what do you see the role of technology being in, in assisting Kiwi Rail in achieving their value goals? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> We're pretty low tech as a business at the moment. I think it's fair to say, um, you know, our rolling stock fleet really uh, has no uh, ability to for any kind of remote diagnostics or anything at the moment. Um, in patches, I think we're actually quite quite developed um, and more so, and that's been driven by um, necessity uh, over the years, particularly around areas of productivity uh, around shunting and things. Where we use a lot of remote control movements and um, and some of the way that we track uh, train movements and thing, which I think. Um, is actually beyond uh, some of the, the technology that's been used in Australia and other markets. So, uh, but but as a general statement, we um, we are not technology savvy here. And so, what the rolling stock procurement in particular is going to allow us to do is to really make a, a quantum leap um, in that technology uh, capability of the business. And things like remote condition monitoring um, and our ability to really feed uh, you know a vast amount of data into our asset management system uh, and try to understand. Um, you know, how can we keep the assets in service, um, you know, at a much greater proportion of time? Um, you know, in, in previous lives, uh, I've worked with uh, with Dana and others who are certainly further along the path than um, than we are here. Um, and I know some of the, the uh, I guess, the capability of, of what's possible with that. So that's a really exciting part of our future. Um, I think we're also looking at a lot of other things, which, um, what would I say? I, I think there's a lot of excitement about, but I'm just not sure we've landed what the real um, value of the technology is going to be. So things like using virtual reality technology for, for training and, and um, troubleshooting diagnostics sort of stuff. There's a lot of examples of that around, but I'm not sure that anyone's really um, nailed what that's going to look like in the end game. I do think there's, there is going to be a role to play for it, but um, it's a little bit unsure at the moment what that is. And I guess the way we, we would typically Think of ourselves here as a is what I call a fast follower, rather than um, you know a, a business that's going to be right at the bleeding edge of that innovation. Because we just kind of don't have the volume, we don't have the the scale um, to enable that. So what we're looking to do, and even with things like propulsion technology, um, is to really keep abreast of what's going on in the market with the with the large suppliers, and be in a position that we can hopefully move quite quickly. Uh, you know, relatively speaking, once that technology comes uh, becomes commercially viable and well proven. Yeah, look, and I think there's also the issue of making sure that there, you know, any of the impediments or the barriers to the adoption of technology are are removed. So there's a bit of work that ARO are doing at the moment around, you know, what are those barriers for industry? Um, how do we actually try and um, remove and unlock some of those barriers and encourage, you know, people to um, innovate. Um, you know, and 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 ensure that I guess the 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 rewards um, are, are there if they um, if they do um, pursue that. Yeah. Um, question specifically here about um, just the um, the rolling stock um, procurement and what was what was the rationale? I guess the the the, the question here is sort of saying that the um, given the size of the rolling stock supply market. Um, and the economy of scale associated with standard product ranges. What was the rationale behind potentially going for a, um, a, a bespoke specification? I guess because you, it's you could you can get what you ask for. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure if that's directed at Lycos like or wagons, but I guess I can answer both. Um, I mean, um, it's it's directed at wagons. Yeah. Okay. Wagons. Yeah. So look, with the with the wagons, um, what we've what we've specified is. Um, uh, what we've tried to do is actually um, the opposite of, I guess, what that question was asking. So what we're trying to do uh, yep. and are doing is, is specifying um, what I would see as uh, global standard um, kind of componentry. So things like um, the WebTech TMX bogey, for example, 
um, is what we specified, and and Knorr Brems, um, you know, brake valves and kit. And so what we're trying to do is actually move towards um, that more off the shelf, um, you know, widely available, and um, and kind of not just mass produced, but but mass supported um, uh, style of componentry. Whereas in the past, um, you know, with our procurements, we've really been almost hostage to this particular supplier, and uh, I've had to, to some degree take what they had as their um, their catalog uh, model, if you like. And what that's ended up doing is we've got something that's that's um, good, but it could be better. Um, and what we're finding is um, certainly some of the support for uh, some aspects of that component supply uh, are not as um, robust as what we would like. Um, and the performance of them in terms of the total cost of ownership uh, isn't what we would like. And look, the decision was made at the time uh, back in 2009, you know, we were an extremely capital starved business. Uh, we hadn't had any investment really for the best part of 20 or 30 years. And so when we got some, we had to get as many physical assets as we could for the money that we had. Um, we're in a very different situation now and, and we're really taking the opportunity to kind of reset our relationship with the supply chain um, and say, hey, look, you know, we want to be much more involved in uh, making sure we get the best value for money uh, and best fit for purpose components for us for the long term. So. Yeah, okay. Um, we've probably probably got time for one more question. Um, there's a there's a few here, but I'll um I'll just try and try and pick one um, that's a, a good one to finish with. I want a, I want a nice meaty one to um, finish with here, Adam. Um, so I guess. Just back on the COVID thing, um, you know, post COVID, how do you how do you how do you think um, you you would manage to restore confidence um, in people? I guess getting on passengers trains, and I know you guys deal with with freight here, but um, just the issue um, as you're seeing it in terms of the debate in in New Zealand around taking public transport over over private vehicles. You got any any thoughts on that? Yeah. So. Um... What we've seen here to a large extent, um, so as I said, we, I, should, I should have the date in front of me here, but I don't, but I think it was about two months ago, we went back to, um, uh, to effect, or maybe six weeks ago, we went back to effectively no restrictions. Um, yeah. We saw a, what I would call a relatively small lag in um, the, uh, you know, people's kind of natural social distancing and wanting to keep away from each other. I would say that persisted for probably a couple of weeks. Um, and you know the things like when you go to the supermarket, having the the trolley wipes and the sanitizer and stuff, which I'm um, you know I'm sure is still very much the norm in in uh, all of Australia. Again, persisted for a few weeks, but has has largely gone away now. And it, it um, you know I've, I've um, started travelling around the country again just the last couple of weeks, and I flew back from Christchurch last night. And when I got to the airport, it was the first time it really felt like it was back to normal in terms of the um, you know number of passengers and people, the way people were moving through the airport and so forth. And so I think that it's really hard to see when you're in the situation that, um, that Australia's in now, and particularly uh, Melbourne, I guess, how yeah. people are going to feel comfortable going back on, uh, you know, in areas where you're kind of squeezed in together. Um, the experience here would show that once people have confidence that actually, um, you know, we're on top of that virus and it's gone, and, and I mean, it, it will, we will get on top of it eventually, whether it's this year or next year or the year after, but um, I think that that will come back quite strongly quite quickly. Um, Perhaps a more interesting question for me, I think, as I mentioned before, is what does it mean for um, those CBD offices and, um, you know, the, yeah. the kind of traditional view where people had to come to the office, you know, nine to five or whatever it was every day. Um, I do think that that's got the um, potential to see a more uh, long lasting change in terms of um, you know, everyone had to go through this, this forced transition to remote working uh, and actually a lot of the fear and, and things that people were worried about with systems mm -hmm. and other sort of stuff uh, has either been worked through or just didn't materialise. And so um, I do think there'll be um, in the long term a less, uh, you know, less demand for that massive influx of people into the CBD um, for peak hours. But yeah, I guess it remains to be seen. Yeah, look, and quite possibly then if that's the case, then, you know, what is the, the role of passenger um, versus freight on some of those, um, you know, uh, networks in urban areas as well is, is probably something that um, needs needs to be discussed, and it's something certainly that the ARA have been been tossing around internally. And it'll it'll depend on each jurisdiction, and it'll depend um, on where you're talking about. But certainly, a broader conversation about that in the longer term is probably 
invaluable as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're we're all out of time. But thank you, Adam. That was um, really insightful presentation. So I appreciate your your time today, and thank you everyone for um, for um, dialing in. So essentially, now that it will be available probably in the next um, 20, 24 to forty eight hours, if you weren't able to catch all of it and you want a copy of it, um, it'll be on our website very shortly. Um, join us tomorrow if you're interested. Uh, our CEO, Caroline Wilkie, is going to be hosting a Women in Rail panel. So we'll see you then. Great. Thanks, everybody. See you later.